Good evening, Bobcats, and thank you for tuning into our show tonight. I'm Stephen Pappas. And I'm Melanie Carreri. Let's get right into it. Last night, the Quinnipiac community got an email sent out by Dr. David Hill alerting them that the Quinnipiac, uh, Quinnipiac is now on an alert level yellow. Matthew Durantic has more on this story. Tuesday night, Quinnipiac announced that 10 students have tested positive for COVID-19. The email mentioned that the 10 confirmed cases have been within the week, with six new cases being confirmed in the past 48 hours. Students like first year Jillian Gallagher still feel safe even with the news. I feel mostly safe still knowing that most of them are off campus. Um, it's definitely a little less secure. I feel a little less secure than I did before the email, but I still feel mostly safe here. Due to the increase in positive cases, the university is moving from or for short QNLA is being moved to a remote format for the spring semester. Applications for QUNLA were due this week and students who were accepted in the program are now looking for online internships. The school of communications is still committed to still offering a good experience for students, even if it's different. Quinnipiac Admissions hosted its first open house this weekend and is continuing to adapt in the COVID-19 era. Hepzibah Rajan spoke to the admissions department about their new strategy. The number of students that enrolled into Quinnipiac University has increased over the past year. The admissions department was surprised by the number of returning students. What was really interesting to me is that when we look at the numbers for our returning students, we actually had about a 5% increase um, in terms of the percentage of students that returned in tw for 2020, as opposed to for 2019. It's one of the highest retention rates we've had over the last five years. Due to COVID-19, students are not applying to colleges like in the past. They are waiting for standardized tests to begin and colleges to reopen for on-ground campus tours. However, Quinnipiac University has taken a different route. Uh, what we've tried to do in response to that has been a little bit more proactive and to get them to engage at an earlier phase um, to really assure them that you know we're all in this uh, experiencing the same things and we're responsive to that on campus tours are limited to a maximum of 10 people at a time visitors need to follow a set of guidelines before arriving to campus for the tour and we do require a um, symptom survey uh, both at the time of registration and at the time when they actually take the tour. However, students don't think this is enough. They could either not really know if the symptoms are there or they could be like asymptomatic, so I don't think that's enough. Instead of an in-person tour, the students felt that a virtual tour was a better and safer idea. You could see the campus visually on like a map and have a step-by-step -step walkthrough and maybe have like a tour guide pop up at the bottom and then they talk you through each step as if you were on campus but you could do it virtually from the comfort of your home. This is Hepzibah Rajan reporting for Q30 News. Quinnipiac has its first black female student president. Q30 got the chance to talk to Olama De Boat to show about her vision for the role. While SGA is already getting ready to work with its newest elected officials, they will also be holding a special election, election in the next few weeks to fill open positions. Currently, she is, I want to make sure that there's some type of form of in-person graduation. My weekend will be held online due to the pandemic. Many are still waiting for the chance to reunite after a sudden end to their senior year. Here's what class of 2020 graduate Julia Shade had to say about this year's virtual alumni weekend. Virtually, then it's just not going to be the same. I probably wouldn't even join it if it's virtually, mm -hmm. honestly, because it's just not even worth it yeah um, i don't know everything that we look forward to like for graduating from quinnipiac and then becoming an alumni it's like we missed out on obviously right. nothing that quinnipiac could have controlled or anybody else but it sucks <laughs> yeah Quinnipiac's Muslim Student Association and South Asian Society worked together to hold their annual Eid and Henna night this past Saturday. Despite everything going on this year, they had a bigger turnout than in previous years. Students were able to learn traditional dance,
food and more about the holiday to stay up to date on those events. Follow the QUSGA on Instagram as they post what is happening weekly. Quinnipiac Student Programming Board is still holding events on campus with social distance guidelines in place. SPB will be holding a virtual painting night Saturday at 8 p.m. in the South Lot Dining Tents. Well, SPB has been utilizing the tents outside in South Lot and marketing events so that um, people have to RSVP ahead of time just so we don't have too many people showing up and so that we know in case someone does happen to get Corona, we can uh, track them and stuff. Coming up after this short break, we will tell you everything you need to know about Connecticut moving into the third phase of its reopening. Plus, Katie Cohen has our national update, but first we go to Hepsiba. What's the weather looking like for the rest of the day? Well, today it was a high of 72 and a low of 49. Tomorrow we'll have a high of 63 and a low of 43. And on Friday, we'll have a high of 65 and a low of 55. This and more after the break. I'm Jenny Garth, and as a mother of three, I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. But here in America, that is a real worry for one in five children. This is unacceptable and something Feeding America is working to solve. Through a nationwide network of food banks, Feeding America serves virtually every community in the United States, including yours. See how you can help your community. Visit feedingamerica.org. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at eatingamerica.org. Welcome to what happened. Governor Ned Lamont announced the movement into phase three of the state's reopening yesterday afternoon. An increase from 50 to 75 percent capacity for indoor restaurants, barber shops, hair salons, personal services, and libraries have taken place. Outdoor events bumped from 25 to 50 percent, with all required to wear masks and socially distance. However, bars and nightclubs will remain closed. As Connecticut is opening up even more, the community or the country, excuse me, is remembering those who have suffered during this pandemic. Katie Cohen is here to share this story. COVID-19 survivors set up more than 20,000 empty chairs at the Capitol to recognize over 200,000 Americans who have fallen to the virus. Each chair represented 10 lives lost. Dion Warwick, Grammy winner and former U.S. Ambassador for Health, said, quote, These chairs will be a visually stunning art installment representing a fraction of the heartbreaking and unimaginable loss of 200,000 lives to COVID-19 in just six months, end quote. Members of the COVID Survivors for Change organization gathered in person and virtually to share stories from people who have lost loved ones. They all shared a moment of silence at noon. The group has declared October 4th as National COVID Remembrance Day. Harvey Weinstein has been charged with six more felonies connected to sex crimes. After becoming a focus in the hashtag MeToo movement, Weinstein was prosecuted on prior charges and is currently serving a 23-year sentence in New York. Prosecutors in Los Angeles have asked for him to be brought back to California for this arraignment. The hearing was originally planned for August, but was moved to December due to concerns of COVID-19. Weinstein has denied all charges and his team refuses to comment on any of the recent news. If convicted of these new charges, Weinstein could face up to 140 years to life in prison. California recorded its first ever giga fire on Monday, meaning the fire has now destroyed more than a million acres making it the first giga fire in the U.S. since 2004. The fire is now burning across several counties and has become larger than the state of Rhode Island. Blazes across the state have ruined 4 million acres so far this year. Part of California, 
parts of California are expected to see some relief this week with temperatures dropping. That's all I have for national news tonight. Back to you, Stephen and Melanie. An email sent out last Thursday was sent to the Quinnipiac community stating that Caitlin Wells, the Title IX coordinator, had stepped down. Hannah Mursky has more details on this hiring process. Well, we couldn't leave it unfilled, right, because we are required to have a position filled with someone who is listed as the Title IX coordinator. Um, and so by me stepping in, um, it shows that we are serious about it um, because for us, Title IX is a part of equity and inclusion because we're making sure that everyone can come to university and be successful and not be discriminated against or harassed based on um, their sex or gender. Quinnipiac has its first black female class president. Hugh 30's Grace McGuire got the chance to talk to Olama De Boat to show about what she plans to do for the senior class. Well, currently she is, I want to make sure that there's some type of form of entrance and graduation for seniors. So I'll be working with the vice president to figure out a way that we can have at least some form of graduation entrance because I know last year seniors didn't get a chance to do that because of COVID, so this may not work out. Quinnipiac has taken great strides to minimize the number of COVID-19 cases by setting aside residence halls for isolation. The Student Health Care Center has been on high alert for... First, I was warned when I called the health center and I gave my symptoms. They were like, you might want to pack an overnight bag, but I was officially told when they gave me my COVID test and were like, yeah, you're going to have to be put into isolation. Not knowing how long they will be in isolation, students have felt the effects of living alone, not knowing if they have contracted coronavirus and not being able to speak to anyone in person. I would say that it worsened my anxiety and gave me a very like poor health, mental health period. Students must remain in isolation until their test comes back negative. The results usually take about three days. In the meantime, students miss out on social interactions, going to events, and hanging out with friends. It didn't really affect my education because we were still mostly remote at the time and I could still like zoom into all my classes. My professors didn't really mind. Um, so I was still able to like show up for classes and get my work done. A list has advice for Quinnipiac officials on how to help students in isolation. For more of an outreach to people like here are our therapy like services. These are people that you could talk to if you want to. Who knows what it's like to be put into isolation until you're in that situation. But maybe with more support, students like a list won't feel as alone. Signing off for Q30 News, I'm Dory McDaniels. Well, the vice presidential debate is happening right now. And if it's anything like the presidential debate, we are in for a show. Uh, Vanessa Blasi has more on the vice presidential debate as well as how President Trump's doing. Vanessa? Well, tonight is the night that Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris face each other in, a, in Salt Lake City at the vice presidential debate happening as we speak. Within the first 30 minutes, it's evident that both candidates are taking a more professional approach this week. Additionally, it's no surprise that the first question was based on the coronavirus and how our country plans to move forward. Especially with the heightened focus on our, the coronavirus after the recent news of President Trump's health condition, the vice presidents will be seated at desks 12 feet and three inches away from each other with plexiglass barriers to protect from possible COVID-19 contraction. Furthermore, President Trump's health condition at the moment seems to be relatively stable after he was released from the hospital on Monday evening. His physician, Dr. Sean Conley says, quote, he's met or exceeded all standard hospital discharge criteria, end quote. Trump's infection may very well have a massive impact on the election as it is unclear whether or not he will be able to attend future presidential debates. The pressure is now on for Vice President Mike Pence to best represent Trump and tonight, tonight and possibly in the future. On a slightly different note, the Pennsylvania Republican Senator Pat Toomey announced his retirement on Monday. At the end of Toomey's next two years in office, he will not run for re-election, nor will he run for governor. Instead, Toomey says, quote, my plan is to go back to the private sector, end quote. This news was a major blow to the Republican Party as it leaves only Democrat Bo Senator Bob Casey Jr. in Pennsylvania. 
Toomey makes it clear that despite his retirement, he still supports Trump's re-election and hopes to be serving his last two years with Trump re-elected. That's all for now. Back to you guys. After the break, Hepzibah Rajan gives you the upcoming weather for this week. Plus, Quinnipiac might be closer, Quinnipiac and Zoom might be closer than you realize, and how Quinnipiac is getting commuter and remote students a chance to get involved. All that and more coming up after the break. Me and my boy Matt had it good. He had catnip that was off the hook. But one day, he brings a girl home, and she's allergic to cats. Every sneeze was a nail in my coffin. Now I'm in a shelter. It's decent, but they don't even have Wi-Fi. now but when my owner lost his job it was rough i was living on the street and one night me and this cocker spaniel got into it so bad i wound up looking like an ice cream cone i cried a little bit but thankfully i got rescued so i'm running i'm jumping all back to my old self and i'm ready to give unconditional love even if you put a lampshade on my head they call me prince like i'm royalty or something but the places I've lived ain't no palaces. So I don't need grilled salmon or a new scratching post. Just give me a cardboard box and a can of tuna and we're good. You can even change my name. I'm cool being the kitty formerly known as Prince. Let's now send it over to Hepzibah Rajan with the weekly weather forecast. Hepzibah. Thank you, Melanie and Steve. This week, we're going to see a few sunny days and mostly cloudy days. On Wednesday, we, today we had a high of 72 and a low of 49. Thursday, we'll be seeing a, six, a high of 63 and a low of 43. On Friday, it'll be a high of 65 and a low of 55. And then on Saturday, we have a high of 74, which is the highest this week, and a low of 55. Sunday will be 67, followed by a low of 49. Monday and Tuesday, they're in their 60s, and the low is in the 50s. For the warm temperatures, we have the two, whereas in Danbury, it's also 62. For New Haven, Hartford, and Norwich, they're all 68, and New London is 69. Over to you guys back on the bench. Yeah, well, Quinnipiac and Zoom may be a little closer than you realize. Sk Skylar Haynes has the story. The pandemic has forced everyone to use computers, smartphones, and new technologies more than ever to stay connected. And for students and faculty at Quinnipiac to stay learning. What would we do without the technology? I can't imagine trying to learn in these times without it. So it's hard to rely on anything else right now. But of course, this hasn't come without its challenges. It's hard to prioritize what you have to help first because if you're helping a student in the tech center that is, you know, having trouble with their Blackboard and can't get lockdown browser to work, but while you're doing that, a professor runs in that just ran over from CCE and is like, I need help with my Zoom card right now. Uh, somebody's got to go help them with the Zoom card because then they can't have a class. Quinnipiac was the first corporate customer of Zoom technologies when it was first developing years ago. And now Zoom is part of everyone's normal across the globe. I definitely think that Zoom has become the new normal for all of us. And uh, I think not only students, but faculty is really depending on uh, IT. And we're really um, relying on them to keep up the great work that they've been doing. But as Quinnipiac logs on more, it puts pressure on the technology department to go into overdrive. You know, people walk by the tech center all the time, you know, in the library. It's, you know, easy. It's hard to miss with the big glass window and stuff. And often, you know, there's students, workers sitting in there, you know, on the computers and stuff. And people may be thinking that, like, oh, they're just sitting in there not doing anything. Like, no. So until or if Zoom meetings turn back into real meetings, Quinnipiac's most tech savvy will stay working hard to keep faculty and students powering through. This has been Skylar Haynes for Q30 News. 
Well, with it being harder to get to know new students this year, the school has added yet another activity that can be done on Zoom. This is a program for commuters, remote, and then resident students, and it's mostly to bring our community together. Uh, we think this will benefit them because it'll bring them closer to campus. It'll also bring our freshman class together as one unity and yeah, Melanie, I know it was so hard just regularly to be making friends freshman year. I can't imagine now on Zoom you have to do that. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine. It's like hard enough to meet new people, like just moving into school. And now with COVID and everything going on and having to stay in your dorm, it's kind of difficult. Yeah, well, coming up, we lost a rock legend this week. Plus, see who's nominated for this year's People's Choice Awards. And it's midterms week and Tammy Riley held a yoga session on the quad to help students relax. Watch all this next on the Q30 newscast. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me, now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me, I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at eatingamerica.org. Welcome back. Let's get right into entertainment with Maggie Smith this week. Maggie, what do you got for us? Thanks, Steve and Melanie. This week's update must start on a bit of a sad note. Eddie Van Halen passed away yesterday at the age of 65 after battling cancer on and off for two decades. His son, Wolf Van Halen, wrote on Twitter that, quote, he was the best father I ever could have asked for. Every moment I've shared with him on and off stage was a gift, end quote. As news of Van Halen's death broke, his friends and fellow musicians paid tribute to the one-of-a-kind talent. Artists like Gene Simmons of Kiss, Def Leppard singer Joe Elliott, and Geezer Butler of Black Sabbath took to social media to talk about memories they shared with the rock icon. Though some members of Van Halen have changed, Eddie was always a constant, and his acclaimed guitar work quickly became the focal point of their legacy. Van Halen was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007, and Eddie is widely considered one of the greatest guitar players of all time. On to a lighter topic, the People's Choice Awards official nomination was released to the public on October 1st. The American Awards Show recognizes people in the entertainment industry through votes by the general public. Fans have the opportunity to vote from now until October 23rd for who they want to come home with an award. The show will be broadcasted live from Santa Monica on November 15th. This year, there are new categories to choose from, including the new artist of 2020, the collaboration song of 2020, and the soundtrack song of 2020, bringing the total up to 44 categories across movies, television, music, and pop culture. And lastly, there was a major mix-up with the voting results on Dancing with the Stars this past Monday. According to Cosmopolitan, Tyra Banks was given the incorrect results, but quickly realized what had happened when the remaining couples on the dance floor weren't actually the ones in the bottom two. In the moment, Tyra informed viewers that it was a mistake from the control room. But since then, many have taken to social media to criticize Banks. Dancing with the Stars executive producer and judge Bruno Tonioli defended her amid the fallout. He said, quote, there was a technical issue as the actual votes were coming in last night. What happened was Tyra actually had the wrong names on her card. As soon as we realized what was going on and we got the correct voting information, we immediately rectified that on air. We spoke to Tyra, we got her to guide us through that. I think she did an amazing job rectifying what happened live on the show. It's not an easy thing to do, what she did. There's a lot of undue criticism, I think, around Tyra, end quote. Dancing with the Stars airs every Monday at 8 p.m. on ABC. 
Well, that's all I have for this week's entertainment update. Back to you guys at the desk. Yeah, being wrong on live TV can definitely be stressful. What else can be stressful is midterms, and one Quinnipiac faculty member is doing her job to alleviate that stress. Jennifer Cuevas has more on the relaxing way to spend midterms. On October 6, students and faculty paused to take a break for a session of mindfulness meditation during midterm week. The event, which was led by Tammy Riley, Director of Fitness and Wellbeing, and Carrie Johnson, Associate Vice President of Operations, aim to let students know there are resources available at Quinnipiac even during unusual times. Sophomore student Cole Johnson has participated in these events about three or four times and said it is now something he simply enjoys doing. Especially now with midterm week, it's a lot to, to handle. Um, so then it's this, but even if it's like 30, 35 minutes, it's just nice to breathe it. Film major Matthew Mugno has incorporated meditation and being mindful in his daily life after attending similar events in the past. Mugno mentioned the importance of being able to self-talk and decompress. It really does affect your physical body. and Your physical well-being is affected by your mental health. I think the experience is great, and this is great because it was outside. Um, this is only the second time I've been outside, so that really changes the experience. Organizers from the event hope that students can realize how important it is to take a break and to just find some peace within yourself, especially during busy midterm week. Reporting for T30 News, I'm Jennifer Cuevas. So Steven, how are you going to relax this weekend? I think I'm going to go home this weekend. I got to give a shout out to my mom. It's her birthday today. She's watching. So happy birthday, mom. Oh, that's so nice. Um, in conclusion, thank you for watching the Q30 newscast. Join us again next Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. From myself and Melanie and everybody behind the scenes, thank you for watching tonight. Make sure you download the Q30 app, the Q30 television app, and stand, uh, stay up to date and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Good night, Quinnipiac.